So have you ever wondered just how dilation drops are working on your eye? In today's video, I'm going to go over the pathophysiology of how the pupil actually dilates and constricts naturally, and then we're going to go over the pharmacology of the drops that your eye doctor is using to make your eyes dilate. Welcome to Salisbury Eye Care and Eyewear. I'm Dr. D. My goal is to arm you with the knowledge you need to take control of your eye health and have the best vision possible. Like and subscribe for videos every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Hi, I'm Dr. D. I'm a doctor of optometry with my own private practice. I'm residency trained in ocular disease and I specialize in dry eye. On this channel, I post educational videos about eye health and vision products. If you're new here, please consider subscribing and hit the bell down below so you never miss a video. In today's video, we're going to be talking about the pathophysiology and pharmacology of dilation. So, you know what time it is, my pupils. It's time for eye school. So today is a true eye school experience because we're really taking it back to pathophysiology, pharmacology. We're going to talk about how the eye's natural process works of dilation and constriction. So let's get into the pharmacology and pathophys, shall we? So in today's video, we're going to talk about how normal pupil constriction and dilation works. Then we'll move on to the different types of dilating drops. I'm going to touch on other drugs that may dilate the pupil, but we're not going to go super in depth on that for today's video. Next, we'll talk about how these drugs work on the pupil, how long you can expect them to last, and then what to expect when you're dilated and how best to prepare for your annual eye exam. All right, so normal pupil dilation and constriction is a function of the autonomic nervous system. The iris itself is actually innervated by both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic cests. <laughs> the iris itself is actually innervated by both the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems, and it's the interplay between those systems that's going to result in pupil dilation or constriction. Const constriction, it is the interplay between those systems that will result in pupillary dilation or constriction depending upon the scenario. So first of all, the autonomic nervous system is referring to everything in your body that occurs that is involuntary or unconscious. If you think about it, there's a ton of body systems that are happening throughout the day, every day that you don't have to think about or control yourself from digesting food to your heart beating to the blink of your eyes, the dilation of your eyes, all of these things are controlled by your autonomic system. These are things that are necessary for life and just kind of happen in the background all of the time. The autonomic nervous system is divided into two sort of parts, the first of which is the parasympathetic system. So parasympathetic system is really controlling everything to do with resting and digesting. When your body's at rest, there are certain functions that are happening, right? These are conservatory functions, things that have to happen. When you tend to be at rest, your body is going to maintain its urine output, for example, whereas when you're not at rest, it may not be concentrating on producing urine. It's going to be digesting your food. Your liver is going to be um, releasing or stimulating bile release and that sort of thing to keep things moving along. All of this is happening when you're resting and digesting. And obviously that system is still going to maintain your heartbeat, your lungs, and keep everything moving. Now in terms of your actual pupils, it is your it is your parasympathetic system that is going to constrict the pupils. So when you're at rest, those pupils are going to be small. So the ganglia for this system, these occur in end tissues and organs themselves rather at a more central point. The postganglionic fibers secrete acetylcholine. So we're going to be talking about acetylcholine type receptors with the parasympathetic system. This is also considered the cholinergic system as opposed to the adrenergic system that we're going to talk about in a moment with sympathetic. So cholinergic is parasympathetic, rest and digest, um, ganglion are at the end organ. That's the parasympathetic system. We're talking about the overall action being inhibitory. Remember the body is at rest in this um, case. And so it's, you know, the constriction of the pupil is one of those things. 
heart rate being decreased rather than increased because the body is at rest. So next we have the sympathetic system. This one's really easy to remember because this is fight or flight. And as it sounds, if your body is in fight or flight or in motion, those are gonna be not an inhibitory system. This is an excitatory system. So your sympathetic system is preparing the body for fight or flight situations. It's an excitatory phase. The ganglia for this system occur along the spinal cord actually, instead of in the end organs as in the parasympathetic system. The sympathetic system secretes adrenaline or noradrenaline at the synapse, and that exerts its effect on the bodily tissue. This is considered adrenergic, and I always remember that because of adrenaline adrenergic. So your sympathetic system is fight or flight. This is happening when you're in motion, there's excitement, you're fighting, you're flighting, things are happening, what does your body do? Well, your pupils dilate in that state, okay? So opposite of parasympathetic, where you're resting and they're constricting, in the sympathetic, you have dilation. Your heart rate, your heart rate is increasing. Your body's like, nah, I got better stuff to do. I don't need to digest and create urine right now. I'm doing things, I don't need that. So you see a decrease in activity through the digestive system with sympathetic exertion. So let's talk a little bit about the eye itself. What is responsible within the eye for that dilation or the constriction? So what is controlling constriction and dilation is the actual iris, the colored part of your eye. You can think about the iris like a curtain. It can be opened or closed, and depending on how open it is or how closed it is, that's how much light is able to make it into the eye. The pupil itself is just an opening, right? So in an eye exam, you know, having a big wide open pupil in, in that whole area that's black, that's just the window. I can see right through that. That's just a hole. There's nothing actually there. That's just the opening of the iris. So the iris itself is where we get dilation and it has a couple of muscles. It has a circular muscle that is right at the center, kind of right by the pupil, and that's called the iris sphincter. So I bet you didn't know you had a sphincter in your eyeball, but you do. And then there's the iris dilator, which is more of a radial muscle um, that is at the outsides of the iris. The iris sphincter is circular. <laughs> it's a cargle. Okay. The iris sphincter is a circular muscle. It is located here around the pupillary margin. It is made of smooth muscle and it constricts. The innervation is with parasympathetic fibers. Remember we talked about the parasympathetic system being responsible for constriction. So that makes total sense. You've got a sphincter, sphincters constrict, and it's innervated with parasympathetic. So because pupillary fibers travel with cranial nerve three, if you have a cranial nerve palsy, you'll actually see pupillary issues with that as well, changes in the pupil. So that's just of note, but those pupillary fibers do travel along with cranial nerve number three. There are three reasons why this sphincter will tighten. In other words, there are three reasons why pupils may constrict. One of those reasons is in response to light, right? So. Um, that's a natural response because your eye is saying, oh no, there's too much light, I'm gonna constrict down so that I don't have so much light blinding me, washing out my retinal photoreceptors and making me not be able to see. And so natural response number one is, is light itself will make the pupil constrict. The second is um, when your eye actually accommodates. So when your eye is focusing, for instance, when you're looking up close, there's a slight little constriction that happens as you go to focus and accommodate. There's also drops. So the third thing that can constrict pupils are drops. So pharmacological intervention. Um, a great example of that that's still used is called pilocarpine. So pilocarpine used to be one of the mainstays of glaucoma treatment back in the day. And now it's still used pre-surgery when we have to do um, a peripheral iridotomy, let's say for narrow angle glaucoma. It's also one of the things we keep in our glaucoma kit in the office, just in case someone were to have angle closure glaucoma. Constrict that pupil down, pull the iris back out of the angle if it's closing. So 
This is something we can use pharmacologically. An old school drop was also Carbacol, and that was another constriction agent back in the day that I don't think is available anymore. Something of note for this part of the video, if you could figure out a way to induce constriction, constriction, as I mentioned just a minute ago, happens when a person focuses. It's part of, you know, focusing up close. So for early presbyopes or even late presbyopes, there are multiple companies right now um, in the FDA process for commercially preparing a preparation of pilocarpine or what have you, one of these constriction drops to help with presbyopia. So I hope in the future I'll be able to make a video of one of those drops when they, once they come out on the market, but there is an area of opportunity to constrict that pupil for the benefit of seeing up close. Next, we're gonna talk about the iris dilator. So we already talked about the fact that that's a radial muscle that's within the iris. It is also smooth muscle, but its function is dilation. It's innervated by sympathetic fibers, and its innervation travels a little different route. It actually comes up the carotid artery before separating out and going down a pretty complicated path that's beyond the scope of this video. So there's three reasons why an iris would be stimulated to dilate, just like with constriction. So same thing, light, meaning not enough light. Gosh, I'm in a dark room, a dim room. I don't have enough light. I'm gonna dilate and get bigger. Um, let's say you're viewing at distance. So whereas with your um, parasympathetic system, you're constricting up close, the opposite of true of your sympathetic. So with the sympathetic system, as you're relaxing, gazing off in the distance, those eyes dilate out a little bit. So there are also drops used to dilate the pupils, and that's what we're gonna talk about next. We've got cycloplegics and midriatics, and they each work upon the eye in a little bit, bit different way to dilate. So the difference between cycloplegic and midriatics is their site of action. Cycloplegics actually tend to give a little bit better dilation because they work not only upon that smooth muscle, radial muscle to dilate the eye, but they also work upon the ciliary muscle, which is what gives you the problem focusing up close. So your examples of your cycloplegics are atropine, cyclopenylate, homatropine, trypicamide, any of those are working both to bring that iris muscle away, so the radial muscle relaxing it, but also working upon the um, ciliary muscle and focusing itself. So that's why those knock out your focusing for different amounts of time. And that just depends upon the drug, right? So tripicamide half percent might only last two, three hours, depending on your iris color, which is also just an interesting point that lighter colored eyes with less pigment tend to just dilate sort of better and bigger than really dark irises. And so I've also noticed in my patients that those lighter eyes stay dilated longer, whereas sometimes if you have darker eyes, they'll come down from dilation faster. You know, your 1% tripicamide is gonna last maybe four to six hours, and then you get into cyclopenylate, and these drugs can last you know, 12 hours. Atropine lasts the longest of all. So those are the types of cycloplegics, and then you have midriatics. Midriatics work only upon the iris muscle, and so therefore they don't give quite as good of a dilation, and they don't last as long either. But guess what? They also don't knock out your focusing. So phenylephrine is the big one there. It comes in both two and a half and 10% typically not gonna use the 10% in anybody because of um, some of the side effects that it can occur. Your phenylephrine 2.5% is commonly used along with a cycloplegic, especially in ophthalmology, to really give the best pupillary dilation so that you can truly see the whole peripheral retina. Cycloplegics, because they give such a great dilation and they work on the focusing system, they have some uses medically as well. So, if you talk about amblyopia, um, you know, in the case of children or adults that we're trying to patch and improve upon amblyopia, you might be familiar with actual patching, you know, using a sticker, or using a cloth piece for glasses to patch an eye. 
but we can pharmacologically patch as well by using atropine. Another use, um, home atropine is another psychoplegic. And I've used homatropine for years in patients with iritis. So if there's danger of the iris itself having a posterior synechia or sticking to the lens of the eye because of all the inflammation in the anterior chamber, this is a condition called iritis when you have inflammation in the anterior chamber. And inflammation is very sticky and it can cause that iris to stick down. So in, a, in those patients, um, not only for pain control, but they have an inflamed iris. So you're, you're dilating that iris so it's not moving in and out and it's like a bruised muscle and very painful when it dilates and constricts. But you're also moving that iris back so that you don't have synechia happening on the lens. So point being like, you know, we use these for routine eye exams, but we also use them for medical control reasons as well. So the very best dilation is a midriatic plus a cycloplegic, tropicamide 1% and phenyl 2.5% are a mainstay. But there's another drop on the market called Pyramid, which is a pre-mixed version of that. It is phenyl 1% and tropicamide a quarter percent, 0.25. So that's definitely one that's great for routine exams, but if you're going to a retina specialist, somebody who's looking at a tear out in the periphery, or they're gonna be doing laser out there and they just need the best dilation possible, best dilation possible is tropicamide 1% and phenyl 2.5%. All right, so let's just do a little pathophys review. Your eye constricts because of the iris sphincter, that's the parasympathetic system, which is also rest and digest. Pilocarpine is the one that will act on it, and it's an inhibitory system. Your pupil dilates because of the iris dilator. That's part of the sympathetic system or the fight or flight. Cycloplegics and midriatics will cause that to occur, and it's an excitatory system. By the way, the reason why your pupils dilate a little bit when you're attracted to someone is because you're in an excitatory state. And so that system is activated, causing a little bit of dilation of the pupils and giving you away to your crush. Sorry about it. So here's my tips for dilation. When you're getting dilated, make sure to block your tear ducts right here after the technician has instilled the drops. If you hold your fingers there, It'll help keep the drops from draining into the back of your throat and tasting bad. You also want to keep your eyes closed and allow the drops to work faster. While you're dilated, don't try to read, look at your phone, or look at your watch because you'll be having trouble up close. You'll be really blurry from your arm's length on in. The only reason you'd be able to see when you're dilated is if you're naturally nearsighted, in which case you could take off your glasses and still have your focal point up close like you normally do, or if you have reading glasses. That's how I got through optometry school, is by a 150 pair of readers, because we would be dilated just about every week as our classmates learned how to look at our eyes. You might want to consider having someone drive you to and from your appointment because you will be able to see in the distance. Most patients do just fine in the distance once they're dilated, but it'll just be really, you know, bright, especially if you go to the eye doctor on a bright sunny day and you may feel more comfortable with a driver. And finally, make sure to bring dark sunglasses because if you don't have them, you're going to end up wearing the really cool ones we have and they are not that pretty. So bring your own. All right, guys. Well, that is it for our dilation video. I hope that helped you understand a little bit more about how dilation drops work, the muscles in the eye that they're working on, and I hope you enjoyed your very first pathophysiology lesson from me on this channel. Make sure to leave me a comment down below if you want to see more videos like this, or if you have other questions, make sure to suggest what you want me to do a video on next. Thanks as always for tuning in. We're here every Wednesday and Saturday at 8 p.m. So make sure to like and subscribe, hit the bell so you never miss a video and we'll see you next time. All right, we made it somehow, some way.